Hey, what's up everyone? Hello from Boston, Massachusetts. I am, um, sorry about that. Oh, sorry about that. I was getting reverb. So I am live uh, from Boston right now. Believe it or not, as you can see from the sweater, I spoke at Harvard today. Yeah, like major bucket list item. So I'm super excited to be doing this live stream. I apologize. I've only had a couple hours of sleep, so I'm I'm really tired. And then, like I said, I spoke at Harvard today. So it was. It's been a long day. Um, so I'm not going to be my usual spunky self today, um, but uh, I didn't want to cancel this live stream because this community is very important to us and uh, I wanted to still do the show. So let me first talk about what goat trees, not goat cheese, goat trees is. Um, goat trees, uh, the acronym GOAT, greatest, you know, greatest of all time is going to be a new series that we are running on our YouTube channel where I interview and dissect the color node trees for Hollywood colors. So some of the greatest colors of all time, uh, the colors from Star Wars and some of the other, um, some of the other, hey, uh, yeah, no, don't show that. Um, so, uh, you know, some of the greatest colors in Hollywood of all time that have worked on multiple series. We're going to be interviewing them. We're going to be decomposing their node tree. Uh, Mel is monitoring the chat right now. So for those of you who are joining us and have a question, have a comment, post them in the chat. Mel produces all of these live streams. So she's monitoring chat and will uh, let me know and post questions that come in. So Today is, is a very uh, interesting show. So I'm going to be talking about the new version of my node tree. Now, why am I talking about a new version? Here's the thing. Your node trees in DaVinci Resolve should be a living document. They should be a living process, meaning that you should always be continuously improving your node trees over time as you learn new things. So as you learn new things from me, as you learn new things from other colorists, it's important that you're continuously improving your node trees. Now, in my last live stream, I think it was a live stream, either that or it was a YouTube video. But in my last video on this, on my node tree, where I show that those swim lanes, um, you know, the, and and show all the different nodes and the breakdown of my node tree. If you notice, I did that in Lucid Chart, right? My recommendation to all of you, especially with how wonky that um, that DaVinci Resolve can be always have a master copy, always keep a single source of truth of your node tree in some sort of diagramming software. Even if it's on the back of a napkin on a piece of paper on your desk. I'm a big believer in Abraham Lincoln's quote, if I had eight hours to cut down a tree, I'd spend six hours sharpening my ax. So I really, I'm a big believer in planning. Um, and, uh, oh, Martin, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. It's good to see you. Good to see all of you. Thank you for joining us today. I, I recognize some faces, some names here. So good, good to have all of you back. Thank you for continuing to support this channel and this community. Um, yeah, it was exciting. I can't believe I spoke at Harvard. That's like such a big deal. Uh, my one of my favorite movies is With Honors with Brendan Fraser. And so to have seen the Harvard Library and to get the private tour and to speak at Harvard was such a big deal. Um, so, you know, so my advice is, is just continuously improve your node tree. And so I actually version mine, which is if some of you saw the title for today's uh, live stream, it, I actually put the version number. So every time I improve my node tree and I go over it with all of you in these live streams or in videos, I'll version it. So right now my node tree is at version 2.1. So I'm going to go over my node tree with all of you today. Uh, is sort of the inaugural episode for goat trees. So, all right, um, and I'll get to some of these questions. You're all asking great questions, so keep the questions coming. Now, more than 
more than 90% of the people that watch the videos on my channel are not subscribed. So during this live stream, please take a, a moment out to make sure you're subscribed to the channel um, because, you know, and like my videos because that really helps me with the algorithms. My goal is to reach 100,000 subscribers by December 31st. So <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if that's too lofty of a goal. I think it's possible, um, but I'll need all of you to help me. All right, so let's talk about my new note tree. So version 2.1. Now, um, for those of you who did not see, did, so did not see the announcement, I publish every week, I pu publish not one, not two, not three, not four, but five videos every week. So in addition to editing and color grading the TV series that we've produced here at Night Studios, I also am on top of publishing the content for the channel to teach all of you while I'm editing, while I'm color grading our shows, I'm making videos for all of you. So you can learn along with me and work right along with me as if you're sitting in my color suite and grading with me. So this week I published a new blog uh, on goat trees and I talk about the different types of nodes in the node tree in DaVinci Resolve. So if you haven't read that yet, I want all of you to go to nightstudios.co, nightstudios.com or nightstudios.co. And then there's a button up in the top right hand corner that says join. If you join, it's totally free. It's the Night Studios Insider Program. So not only will you get access, early access to a lot of my videos and content and blogs, but there's a hidden community forum in there where you can post on the forum as well as read my this week's articles. And I posted a detailed article on all of my nodes and all of the node trees and I, I just decompose the node tree and explain the different node types. So it's really important for you to have read that as we go through my node tree today. So let's go ahead. I'm going to share my screen. And let's go ahead and jump right into DaVinci Resolve. All right. So hopefully all of you can see my screen. Mel, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, what I'm going to do is let me hide this. All right. So now I'm because I'm traveling because I'm in Boston this week. I'm on my uh, 15 inch MacBook Air. So one thing I want I I don't have as big of a screen as if I was at home. So let me know if any of you cannot see something. But um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to go through and explain groups with all of you. So well, we talked about this in a previous video, but I want to go over it again because I had some some last minute questions come in after I, after the live stream ended. So I want to talk about those and have all of you ask me any questions about groups. So the way you want to group your clips in DaVinci Resolve, first and foremost, it is super important that you use groups. Uh, if you're working on a feature film, if you're working on a TV show, whatever it may be, you know, you're not working on like just a YouTube video. I mean, you could do it with YouTube videos. That's fine. I even group clips, even if I've only got one clip, just because of the way I run my node structures. But, you know, when you create a group, some people will tell you that you should group based on scene. I think that's a bad idea. Let me tell you why. I, I'm not throwing shade on those YouTubers. I'm just telling you why I don't agree with that. When you group based on scene, you could have multiple cameras. Like we have three cameras at, at Night Studios. Camera A is an Aerie, uh, camera B is a red V Raptor, and camera C is a red Komodo or a DJ Ronin 4D. But just because they're all filming the same scene, that doesn't necessarily mean they're all the same lighting conditions and and are you know are all balanced the same way. So because of that, because there may be different exposures uh, across each camera, because of the, they're shooting at a different angle, I don't group my clips based on scene number. I group them based on luminosity. I group them based on exposure, how the scene is lit. So I could have three different groups for, you know, different lighting and, and uh, you know, different angles even though they're part of the same scene number. So my recommendation to all of you is y there may be situations where you, all of the same clips and all the same scene may go into one group, but don't 
do that all the time. Do it, do your groupings based on lighting conditions. That way, when you go in here and you adjust, for example, the luminosity, let me go to something here. So let's say I'm, oh, let me unlink that. You know, I'm going here and, and if, if this shot on this camera is like super dark and I need to, you know, and I need to light it up, bring up the luminosity on it. I don't, you know, the other clips that are in that same group should have the same low exposure. And so I don't have to go in there and make these minute changes at the clip level for every shot. I am, I'm hoping this makes sense to all of you, but basically if you have a really dark shot and a really light shot in the same group, what do you think I'm gonna to do to that really light shot by, by pumping up this luminosity all the way? You know, I'm gonna blow out that other clip. So what's gonna happen is I'm gonna to go to that other clip, I'm gonna to have to go into the luminosity and I'm gonna to have to lower that luminosity and it's just gonna be a pain in the butt and you're totally, you're, you're, you're um, what's the word I want to use? You're, you're, there's, there's no reason to use groups if you're going to have to end up going into each and every clip and fix the luminosity because you grouped dark shots and really light shots together. You're just totally negating, that's the word I was looking for, negating the purpose of groups. So try and group your, your clips all in the same group with the same exposure, with the same luminosity. All right, so let's go through my individual clips in the pre-group. All right, the pre-group is going to apply all of your changes to every single clip in the group. And anything at the clip level is going to apply it to just that clip. So let's go over my pre-clip. The first thing I do is noise reduction. I do any of my noise reduction here. Um, if I'm dealing with, you know, for some reason, a, a, a very poorly exposed shot, or if there's for some reason a lot of noise in the shot, I'll, I'll do my noise reduction as the very first thing I do. Then I pass it to the IDT. Now let me, I, I know this kind of was confusing in the last video. I don't use color space transform. There will be colorists that will teach you to use cut CST. I don't use it. And, and, and I've, I talked about this in my last video, but basically the reason why is if you look at my project settings, I use color managed workspace. <clears throat> and the reason for this, and if any of you want to take a screenshot of this, you can, but, um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Um, I'll, I'll set my input color space to DaVinci wide gamut, intermediate, and then color managed. And then my one change in addition to that, that I'll do here, um, you want to make sure you use separate color space and gamma. I'll do wide gamut intermediate, and then I'll change this to HDR 4000. Now, this is a very common question that I got in my last, you know what, everyone, I need to get some water. Give me one second. <coughs> Sorry, everyone. I've been talking all day when I was speaking today on stage, so I've, I've got a dry throat. Sorry about that. Okay, so th this was a very common question I got in my last video was what, why do you change your timeline working luminance to HDR 4000? The reason why is when you set it to HDR 4000, you're actually setting the luminosity um, to what was more, what the camera captured in real life. It's more equivalent to what the human eye can see at the time it was captured. So if you decide, hey, you know what, Alyssa, I really like the idea of having DaVinci auto detect the camera from the metadata and, and just automatically do it for me and, and convert it to Rec. 709. Um, and I'm, and so if you do follow the same project settings um, I'm using here, make sure you change this working uh, timeline, working luminous data 4000. Now, I can't take any credit for this. For those of you who know the, the incredibly famous Mark Todd Osborne, he actually uh, got this from another gentleman. I want to say it was Colin. I can't remember where Mark got it from. I think it was Colin Kelly. Um, but it's it's a very commonly used project setting for Hollywood colorists. 
So if you know, if you're like, oh, I don't know, I don't, I, I don't know if I want to do this. I don't, I just don't trust it. That I actually multiple Hollywood colorists use this same setup. Okay. So uh, what were we talking about? Okay, so IDT, I have this here. So you're probably saying, okay, listen, if you're using DaVinci Color Managed, why are, why do you have an IDT node? Well, it's because in the case that DaVinci Managed can't accurately detect the camera and the gamma, uh, it'll, it'll load it up in log. It'll load it up in log format. So what you end up having to do is you end up having to manually select it. Right. So if it can't figure out what the heck it is, it can't convert it to Rec 709, which is my working color space. Now, another question that some of you are wondering, hey, Alyssa, speaking about Rec 709, do you do you prefer working in aces or Rec 7? That's a that's a com that's a complicated question because I actually switch between the two. A lot of the times I will work in the larger working color space um, with aces. Um, but you know, but I'll also work in Rec 709. It really just depends on the project, um, you know, what particular TV series or episode I'm working. But um, most of the time, I'm I'm in Rec 709. So uh, yeah, so color space transform, I it's usually off. Um, so, but it's there in case it's available for me, and you know, in case I want to. The point to keeping an updated timeline uh, is, you know, it, within your structure, is to not have to constantly be adding new nodes. That they're there and available for you when you want to use them. Luminance. This is what I talked about earlier. Now, you know, a common question I get is, "Hey, Alyssa, do you prefer using the custom curves, or do you, do you prefer using the HDR wheels and the exposure?" Um, so I, I do want to confirm with all of you, unless this has changed, uh, the curves are color space aware, uh, and the HDR wheels are for sure color space aware. The primary wheels are not. So if you're working within the primaries wheels and you go in here and you change the offset, this is not color space aware. Um, so I'm usually adjusting my... I'm usually adjusting my luminosity and the HDR wheels. I like to use the exposure wheel. As many of you know, I also do have the DaVinci Resolve mini panel. So I try and use as much of the mini panel as I can. And it's, it's really easy for me to switch on the mini panel to the HDR wheels and uh, modify the exposure. But again, the HDR wheels are aware of your color, your working color space. So if you're in Rec 709 or if you're in ACES, any changes that you modify here in the HDR wheels for luminosity or for color, it is aware of your color space and you will see more buttery, um, just really just crispy, buttery changes being made to uh, your, your final image if you use the HDR wheels. Now, in general, when you are doing color balancing, okay, so that's luminosity. Let me reset that. In general, when you're doing color balancing, uh, it, it is okay to go ahead and use your primaries wheels. You really, I mean, you it's not necessary to be in, in a color space aware tool set. It's just a lot quicker and faster if you want to just quickly grab your offset wheel and you know and and color balance it, you know, set your white balance, that sort of thing. Um, to just grab your offset wheel and do that. Uh, for those of you who are like me um, and come from, you know, print, printer light, <laughs> hashtag printer lights life, um, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm a big printer lights girl. So I love, I love working here on color balance. So again, um, first noise reduction, second IDT, if any, uh, then set your luminance, you know, make sure your shot is properly exposed and then do your color balancing. Once all of that is done, now you're hopefully starting to see why I said group your clips together based on the exposure versus just the scene. We now go to our clip level. Before I go to our clip level, Mel, are there any questions I, sh I should jump on? Yeah, just one question. Okay. So, uh, How long has it been since Hollywood started using individual? Oh man. So that's an interesting question, Cello. Did you know this is a very rarely known, but DaVinci Resolve is actually not an original black magic design product. DaVinci Systems was the original company and DaVinci Resolve 
costs somewhere in like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a license. Um, I want to say it's if memory serves correctly, correctly, it's either two hundred fifty or five hundred thousand. It was like basically close to like half a million dollars or some crazy number like that. So um, what ended up happening was, and it was only used in Hollywood because obviously who can who you know what what consumer can afford that. Um, but Black Magic came along and said, no, we're going to turn this entire thing on its side. As many of you may know, um, uh, Divin you know, the big business model behind Black Magic is to democratize cinema. They want to democratize cinema, which is why a lot of their equipment, the ATEM switchers, uh, everything, is significantly cheaper than what of the you know what the more legacy systems uh, charge uh, for the same thing. So they're really out to democratize things. So they came along, bought uh, DaVinci Resolve, and said, not only are we going to lower the price, but we're going to offer a free version to the community. Now, how long ago that was? I'd have to Google it. Uh, when did Black Magic acquire DaVinci Resolve? Yeah, it was 2009. So that was a good question. Um, yeah, so the, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm strangely obsessed with the history of stuff. I love knowing about the history behind things. So yeah, it's been quite, it's, quite, it's been a minute. So 2009, 19. So yeah, over 10, 11, 12, 13. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's been over a decade that they've owned it. So if you think about it, DaVinci Resolve has come a long way since 2009. Right. I mean, these the more recent versions, especially 18, um, it's it's insane. Like like what we have now with depth maps and magic masking uh, and just the I, I'm obsessed. I don't know why anyone would use any other tool besides DaVinci Resolve, at least to color grade. How can we get the naturalization? So, OK, so this is a good one. I, I did cover this in my last video. That's a good question. Thanks for asking it. Um, if you go over here, hopefully all of you can still see my screen. Um, if you go over here to uh, the post group, that's where I put my halation. Um, so I'll typically use the, and if you notice, for those of you who can see that, even if I don't use anything in my timeline, I still have the filter there. I, I'm Work smart, not hard, right? You'll always hear me say that. So I always have my filters already applied to the node and ready to go, and I just turn it off. So if I, you know, whether I apply film grain to something or not, even if I don't have film grain on there, I'll still have the filter there. That way, when I'm in a rush, because one of this, this is what you, all of you are going to learn about being a Hollywood colorist. Time is money, right? You have to think about every second, every minute that you spend doing something and trying to think of where can you, you know, cut the fat, where can you just, you know, be faster and more efficient. Um, just building out your node tree at first and then applying the filters and then just turning it off, even if, you, you know, you're not going to use it, just have it off. But um, to answer your question, I put mine in the post group and I usually um, have it off and I use the halation, the halation filter. So you can play with all these things. Maybe I'll do a whole video on halation because it is a very commonly requested thing. Um, I Maybe in a few weeks, I'll, I'll do a, a dedicated video just on filmic looks like with halation, grain, and glow. Um, but yeah, there is actually a filter built into uh, DaVinci Resolve for halation. Good question. Do you apply noise reduction and cache it for to relieve the CPU or do you turn on the noise reduction note at the end. Ooh, Martin, you always have the best questions, Martin. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, everyone, for those of you who did not do not know this, noise reduction will kill your CPU. And, and Martin, it sounds like you, you've been to the show with this, um, pun intended. Uh, it, it will kill your CPU. So I have a fully loaded Mac Studio, uh, 128 gigs of RAM, 32 core CPU, 64 core GPU. And noise reduction still just hammers my system. Uh, I typically, since I know that I don't need to keep it on, Martin, that's that's usually the strategy I use, is I will get the noise reduction where I want it. And 
uh, I will, I'll just like disable it, turn it off until I'm ready to, to render. The only thing is you got to make sure to remember to re-enable it, obviously, when you're ready to deliver, because um, I have done that before and, and it's it sucks, especially when you're talking about rendering, you know, feature length film um, or I'm trying to rush something to AMC movie theaters and, and time is of the essence. But yeah, and then I've realized I, I didn't re-enable the node when I delivered it and I have to go back and regenerate my DCP. But yes, make sure uh, to do it. You guys, guys and girls, you can keep uh, this this on if you want, but just understand that it's really going to impact your, your performance. Uh, on your primaries, why or when do you use log wheel setting? Oh God, Martin, man after my own heart. Great question. So I actually, look, here's the thing. And a lot of you will, will hear me say this. Stay away from anyone who tells you that something is the wrong thing to use or, you know, um, like what you're doing is bad or what you're doing is wrong. There is no right, no wrong, unless, you know, uh, despite, the, uh, unless we're talking about the things we were talking about earlier, um, there really is no wrong way to do it and only no, not, oh, Jesus, what is wrong with me? I can't talk today. I'm so, I'm so tired. Okay. Let's try this again. There's, there isn't just one way to do things in DaVinci Resolve. You, there's multiple ways to do something. Um, your log wheels are just as powerful uh, as your HDR wheels. Martin, I don't know if you saw the last video. I, I actually did a video comparison um, between the look of the skin tones on China White on a scene between the primaries, the log, and the HDR wheels. And so if you, it's it's only like a, I think it's like a three minute video. So it's not very long if you want to watch it. But my recommendation, oh, hey, Ontario, it's good to see you. Um, my recommendation to you on the HDR wheels is, and don't laugh, but this is, this is the way I approach it now is, <laughs> If, if there's a, a quick and efficient, easy way for me to do it on my mini panel, those are the wheels I'll use. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. It sounds crazy, but like, you know, I'll get so tired from color grading. Like, give me a, a thumbs up or a like if you agree with me. Like, there's nothing nicer to just like lean your elbow on, you know, your arm on your, your mini panel and just use the knobs. Like, I'm such a printer lights girl. But I just, it, it, you know, I, some things where, you know, if I, if I have to use the wheels, I'll just say F it and I'll just like, you know, I'll, I'll switch to the HDR wheels or I'll switch to the um, log wheels depending on, on how tired I am. But I just, I, I really do prefer to use the RGB knobs uh, when I'm, when I'm grading. Um, it's just, yeah, Martin, like, especially when, come on, man, like after you're grading for 10, 12 hours. You know, you're just like, I'm not, I don't want to sit there and play with the the balls. I want to, I want to like use the knobs, you know? Anyway, yeah, it's, I, I just, I, I can't, I feel like there's just no wrong answer to anything. There's not one right. It's like, you know, I don't know. Hopefully I don't offend any of you when I say this, but it's, it's like when somebody says, well, there's only one right way to heaven or there's only one right religion or one, you know, whatever, whatever your opinion is on the matter of, of religion. But then, you know, it's kind of like that, right? Like there's no one path. I feel this is just my opinion. I feel there, there isn't just one path into anything. And there's, there's always, maybe it's my hacker mentality as a hacker, but like, I feel like there isn't just one right way to do it. There's all kinds of different ways. There's just, you know, does Martin feel like using the HDR wheels right now or the log wheels? Um, but if you look at that video, you'll notice that they do actually take on a different look. So depending on, you know, when you see when I'm trying to get more finite details with the HDR wheels and trying to adjust that back wall that was behind the talent, and the fact that the walls will typically live in the light region um, on your lights wheel, on light wheel, um, or mid-tones, for example, you know, you're going to affect that wall and the person's skin at the same time. So it's really just trying to figure out, okay, what are the right, what's the right level of granularity at that particular scene, at that particular moment? So, you know, maybe because the HDR wheels are a lot more finite, 
and you have the ability to adjust those different zones. Do you remember that from the video, how you can change the zones of each wheel? Like, I just feel like there's so much power and flexibility with the HDR wheels to a point where you could even enable and disable certain wheels. And by the way, create a custom wheel. Did you know that? Did you know you could create a custom HDR wheel and define your own zone? It's like, it's insane how powerful the HDR wheels are. Like, I should do an entire video just on the HDR wheels. But, you know, I, I just feel like, thanks, Ontario. I just, I just feel like it's, hmm. you know what it is, uh, Martin? I feel like it's like saying, do I want to go in with the sniper and get that sort of finite, you know, surgical, just, you know, take out that target with the sniper? Or do I want to come in with a shotgun and just spray the whole room and hope that I get the target. Oh, that's a great analogy. That's a great analogy. Like it's the difference between trying to shoot someone. This I, I got dark on all of you. I apologize, but it's like trying to shoot someone, you know, in a room full of people with a shotgun versus trying to take someone out with a very surgical scoped, um, you know, sniper but you know so think of think of the oh yeah it's so worth money think of think of the hdr wheels as kind of like that surgical more finite approach to editing being able to create custom zones and de define what zones those individual wheels affect in your image versus the log wheels and the primaries primary is more of the fat brush on a on when you're painting and the hdr wheels being like the little finite sharp tiny paint brushes that give you more control over where you're painting. Hope that makes sense. Hopefully it was a good analogy. Um, yeah, Ontario, we, I'm absolutely in love with the mini panel. I, I won't throw shade on the micro panel people that are out there in our audience. Love the micro panel, any kind of panel. micro panel, mini panel, whether you pay the extra money for the mini panel, I, you know me, I go big or go home. I, I just got the most expensive panel. One day, the advanced panel, but I'm waiting for them to release one. I was just having a conversation with another colorist about this, that the advanced panel was actually released a long time ago. The, the advanced panel is actually very old. I don't know if you guys know this or not, guys and girls. But um, I, I know the Black Magic is going to actually refresh it and release a new version of the advanced panel, and I'm so waiting for that. So anyway, uh, yeah, great questions, everyone. Uh, is, usually, is, usually to, is it usually to have... Clean key, you have to make a corrector node at CST Rex 709. I'm having trouble in, uh, understanding your question, Wazim. Uh, can you try rephrasing that? Um, having trouble understanding that, sorry. Um, OK, uh, let's move on. I uh, apologize. I know my wife is hungry. We haven't eaten dinner yet, so I'm going to try and get through this quickly. Um, OK, so that is the, let's go back to the clip group. Okay, so once we go through all of our color correction, our luminosity changes, um, and anything like that, noise reduction in pre, um, as Martin said, you know, be really careful with that noise reduction node. It's gonna it's gonna peg your CPU. I guarantee you. Uh, so, and then at the individual clip level, we can adjust our luminosity. Then I go to balance, and then I do any additional color balancing that I. A lot of you, I, I want to make this clear. I just want all of you to know something. So. And I feel like I didn't cover this in my previous video. When you're doing white balance, do you remember how I told all of you, you know, find the area of the scene that will probably stick out the most with your with your audience, um, that where they're going to expect it to be white. Um, otherwise, they're going to feel like something is off or wrong, and they won't know what, but subconsciously they'll know something's not right. And I said to use the teeth versus their eyes. Well, you know, there are some situations where you may not be able to get a good area of the teeth. Maybe they're not smiling or, and you see how his eyes are closed. Maybe, maybe the talent's eyes are closed. So in those cases, I'll, I'll find another area that I, that I know my audience will expect to look pure white. And a lot of times it's a wall. Now, so, you know, in several of the, the um, China white scenes, I've been grading, I've been white bouncing against the wall and you know, I'll, I'll use Omniscope, by the way, yes, a dedicated Omniscope video is coming. And guess what? I have some exciting news. Omniscope is now a sponsor of this channel. It's a, yeah, I'm so excited. It's like our first sponsor. I'm so excited. That and I love Omniscope. Um, so for those of you I've, I've, uh, who haven't seen yet in the last couple of videos, I've been unveiling Omniscope and how amazing the scopes are. 
Uh, but in Omniscope, you can actually take your, your, your masking tool and you can mask a certain area of the wall or mask a certain area of the face. And it'll, it'll just show you that area of the image in, your, in all your Omniscopes. And so one of the things I want to let all of you know, if you end up choosing a different area to white balance against and you do get it perfectly white, remember, because of how finite you can get with images, if you do that and you white balance for a certain area of the wall and, and everything else looks kind of wonky, yes, that's my that's my word, wonky. Um, if every if like the image just doesn't feel properly white balanced, then just start again. Take another area of the wall and maybe, you know, and maybe white balance for that and then check the rest of your image. Remember, this isn't a perfect um you know, that's what I love about color grading is there's no one right way, perfect way to do something. There's just your way and the way you decide to do it. And if you're balancing and it just looks off and it feels off and you can't understand why or just pick a new area to white balance against, you know, use your use your auto and, and white balance against that and choose a different area or do it manually. And just, you know, maybe the area that you that you white balanced against, maybe it wasn't the best area to choose, you know, you know, maybe you like this kind of more cooler image where I'm white balancing for that gray there, you know, versus this, which is definitely a lot warmer. Did you all of you see that? See that difference? You know, I, I mean, it's really just you as the director or the cinematographer that, you know, or the colorist. What 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 do you like better? You know, so once you get that uh, white balance, then move on to contrast. Now, for those of you who are like, Alyssa, we, we we've seen your node. Tell me, show me the new things. OK, so. Yes, I did. I I did it. I I. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh. Let me check the questions, everyone. If we color grade log footage, if I need to take a great key for scan, should I create a corrector node and link it to the source, then make CST log to Rexner and make the key? If I need to take a great key for scan, should I create a corrector and link it to Um, yeah, I, I think I'm understanding your question, Wasim. It feels like you're over engineering it. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't link that and do just a CST on it. I've, I, I mean, if, if, unless I'm not understanding your question properly, um, it feels like you're over engineering it and over complicating it. So this is what I would do, um, when dealing with skin tones and I'll, I'll cover that. Um, but what I typically do is if I cannot completely separate the skin tone, and I think this is your question is in regards to my previous statement about color correcting for a wall, because that lives in the in the gamma and in, in the you know the mid, uh, just like skin. If you try and grade against the wall and you you know you're gonna affect the skin, how do you separate the two? How do you deal with that? Uh, I wouldn't do anything with CSTs or anything. What I would do is you could do two things. Number one, you could depth map it. So, you know, you could create a depth map. And, um, you know, so, and I'll explain, and it's perfect that you asked this question right now because this is exactly what I was going to get to, was that I created, if, if, if you guys see in my, guys and girls, in my new version of my node tree in version 2.1, in the previous version, I didn't have any depth maps. So I created a parallel node structure depth maps so I could apply different looks to each depth map. And then I layered it. So that way, if I want to, you know, and I go in here and I'm like, first, I'm, I'm going to grade against the depth map. And then if I can't get the depth map, because for some reason, our talent is too close to the wall, or, you know, I'm affecting areas of the depth map that I just can't isolate. Then I move on to masking. So I started, a, 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 I, I look, at, one of the things a lot of you is you get to know me better. You're going to learn I'm a hierarchical thinker. So I think very hierarchically. So I'll, I'll start with the depth map. And if I fail at the depth map and I can't get it right, if I can't get it precise enough, then I'll move on to a mask. And then, uh, so I'll start with the depth. Then I'll start, then I'll move on to the mask and I'll try and mask it. And then, so I'll go over here to the mask and, you know, for any reason, you know, I'll try, I'll come in here 
you know, and I'll try and like isolate out the guy's, you know, the talent's face and then, you know, grade the wall or something like that. And I, and block, you know, and then I'll invert it. So I'll block out his face. And then you can see if I hit shift H, you can see that I'm, I'm now going to grade against the, you know, I can grade everything else living in the midtones without affecting his skin. Right. But what happens everyone, Martin, you know, Ontario, you know what I'm about to say, I, why, why I hate masking is it's like you got, especially when you're dealing with like delivering something to AMC movie theaters or, you know, TV, whatever, it's got to be spot on. You got to be, it's got to be perfect. And then sometimes, you know, you get a really, really shitty tracking. Um, and it's just, you know, you deal with all of these problems with masks and I'm, I'm just, I hate using my, if you notice the order of operations here, it's based on the order in which I like to grade. So depth, if I have to isolate out, I'll depth map it first and then I'll resort to masking. Um, but, you know, and then what you're going to notice here is after my parallel layers of, of depth maps and masking, if I still can't get it, I'll try a broad stroke look. So I'll just go in here and I'll just attempt to, you know, get more finite with my HDR wheels. For those of you who haven't seen the video yet, that icon right there will expand out my zones and I can modify and adjust the zones for each individual HDR wheel and then try and I try and do broad stroke changes with the H, the SDR wheels um, when if my depth maps and my my masks fail so those are the a lot of the big changes with this new version of the node tree in 2.1 is you know uh the depth map it's there if i need to use it my masking it's there if i need to use it my qualifiers it's there if i need to use it um and then um the vignettes right your power windows and yeah we just talked about that but um so you know, I, I'll go in here and I'll use the spotlight tool. And then, you know, and you've seen me, uh, I apologize if a lot of this is repeat from previous videos, everyone, if you've, if you've been binge watching my videos, um, I'll go in here and I'll, I'll kind of, you know, focus the viewer's attention on our talent and I'll darken out the rest of it with the spotlight tool. Oh, by the way, don't do this, everybody. Like this is, this is, this is going to look really funky. I mean, you can, if you want, but it's just, it doesn't look right. Um, so with the windows, if you, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know if any of you have seen. So um, they'll, I'll, I'll, I can't remember who it was, but someone had done this where they, they went in here, they went into luminosity, you know, they, they got it to, you know, they exposed for where, you know, this dark moody feel that they wanted, but they wanted to draw attention to the talent's face and they did something like this. Um, you're, you're, it's, it's, it's just, it doesn't feel right. It's like, you know what that looks like is you're basically exposing for the face and you're, it looks like someone is seriously like on set hitting the talent's face with the light. It's really weird. Like I, it's my recommendation. Again, you can do what you want. It's, there's no right way or wrong way. Just, but it looks weird. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, don't like, just no, just no. Um, you know, so always, you know, what I do is I'll expose for the background, right? Go to here and then I'll invert. And then we're, we're blocking out where we want to focus the audience attention. And then, uh, you know, on our luminosity, I'll go here bring the luminosity up, ah, come back, you know, I'll expose for the background and then um, I'll come down here to the spotlight, you know, and adjust for where I want the attention, right? It just, I don't know, it just to me looks more natural. I don't want to throw light at a talent's face with the spotlight like that, it just to me looks funky. Looks wonky, man. Okay, so uh, so yeah, so that's that's the big changes in two point one is I've I've added a, a layer mix of different depth maps and then uh, masks, and then we pass that down to just a broad stroke look development. Um, 
you know, and you can, I mean, this is all look development, right? So if you look at this, I, I probably should have said that earlier. This is your, your loom, your balance, color balance and luminance and, and, and contrast, right? That's your color correction. And then this is our look development. So basically what I'm doing is I'm, I'm allowing myself, I'm giving myself the latitude to create different looks at different levels. So I can depth map out the kids. I can depth map out the guy. I can apply a look for each individual depth map. And then I can go in here and I can create uh, different looks based on, you know, at a mask level, if, if depth map isn't really working for me. And then uh, if all that fails, it's like, you know, F it. Let's just go with the whole thing. Let's just treat the whole thing like our easel and see what we can do at a, at a broad stroke level with each chair wheels. And then, you know, we've got our HSL qualifiers if that fails, you know. I just, I this is a, the order of operations that makes sense to me where I always like to try and start with the depth map because the depth map just, it feels like you're going to, I, there's, you can break an image with anything, but it just feels like it's a lot harder to do with the depth map versus like a mask, a magic mask. I, I, and you've heard me say this before. I just, I try and avoid magic masks at all costs. I just, I don't trust them. AI is great. I, oh, it's amazing what they're doing with it. Magic masking is great, but you, a lot of you take a take a close look at those YouTube videos where people are showing you the power of magic mask. You notice they always choose a video where there's a clear, easy distinction between the talent and the background. And it just, of course, the magic mask is going to be perfect. There's like nothing behind the talent, you know, and they're not moving their hands in front of their face. And, you know, just, it's a really, a really simple, easy, uh, video for the the colors to use and show off a demo of how to use magic masking because you're going to get a really perfect mask with it. But one of the things you learn on my channel is like I use real world stuff. It's real world, you know, TV shows shot on our set, um, features shot on our set. And a lot of the times it's really difficult to get a perfect mask in those situations where you're dealing with color grading a feature film or you know, a TV show, it's tough. Like, you know, a lot of these videos where people are teaching on YouTube, yeah, this is good. Yeah, this is great. Thank you for making this video. I didn't, you know, know that you could do that with this, or I didn't know, you know, you had to add that serial node first. But at the same time, if you look at the footage being used, it just isn't something you would get on a feature or on a TV show. There's just a lot more, it's more nuanced. It, there's more stuff that could really mess up that mess. So I, I try and avoid it at all costs. Anyway, I'm mumble, I'm rambling now. Um, so uh, so then my, you know, my power windows, then I move on. Oh, I did add a colorist. <laughs> I, I didn't have it before because I'm the colorist, but just in case any of you hire colors. Now, what I'm gonna be doing is every time I update my node tree, especially minor or major new changes, I'm actually going to start exporting my shots for all of you. So all of you can, I'll grab a still and then I'll export that still for all of you. So the latest version of my, um, of my node trees are right here. So I'm going to go in here and I'll export it for all of you. So you can go download it from the insider forum. I will only post them on our forum. So um, if you haven't registered yet, again, it's free, but register on the night studios insider forum and you'll get access to all my latest node trees. Um, but that's it. I, I, okay, let's let's switch to comments. Let's switch to comments. Uh, stop screen sharing. Okay. Uh, add the girlfriend. <laughs> that was that cracked me up the first time because I was like, "Ooh, wife node. A you know girlfriend node. That's you know it just there's it's funny. The reason why I found that so funny, Martin, the first time you said it was because it's like it's it's totally true because just one thing I learned as a colorist is I'll get so many people giving me suggestions and recommendations and things that they think I should do. And, and it's like, I never asked for their, <laughs> it's like, not just on writer. You're like, Oh man, that's so rude. But no, it's true. It's like, you know, it feels like, I mean, and I love that about, you know, the collaborative nature about what we do, but I just feel like a lot of people, offer their input on what they think you should do without you even, you know, asking their input on it. Anyway, I'm, I'm, you know, rambling. Ontario, the only, the only reason 
And to use a corrector node for keys is for the rest of the adjustments you make. Don't change it afterwards. So you did your original video, right? I hope that helps your question. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, sorry, Hunter. I was having trouble understanding what he, what the individual was asking earlier. Um, uh, sorry, what was who was asking that? Wasim, yeah. Sorry, I uh, Wasim. I hope I answered your question. I just it's been a long day. I'm like super tired. But you know, basically, it sounded like what you're trying to do. You were asking was like, hey, look, what's the easiest approach to you know, isolating skin tones from this. Because I mean, look, look at the hotel room in here, right? Like if I try and color grade that wall right there behind me, you can all look at it. You, you can tell that any changes I make there is going to be in the midtones and it's going to affect my skin because that's where the skin lives. It lives in gamma, it lives in the midtones. So anything in the midtones that you try and grade is going to mess up. It's going to change your skin tones. So if you were asking like, what's the easiest way to separate all this out so I can change it without affecting the face or the skin tones of the talent, you know, my advice, try and use depth maps, try and use, you know, as a last resort, try and use, you know, magic masks and, you know, or use power windows. You can use power windows as well. I, I, it's like, like I said, like just, there's just no right single right way to do it. There's just, your way that you choose to do it and what looks good as long you know at the end of the day it's i guess the best way to say this is my my advice is as long as the image looks good like no one's it's not like you're going to be up there accepting the emmy award or you know the oscar and they're like you know did you use power windows or did you use depth maps you know to to get that grade you know oh use depth maps give us the emmy back you know <laughs> no one's going to do that it's just how good you know does the image look great does it achieve what you wanted to achieve does it evoke the emotion you wanted to do evoke that's all that matters you know and then you know to hell with the rest of them you know they, if they have a problem with it uh let's see before you go to dinner and you should do a future vid on shared nodes if you do and look at the clip oh yeah, no, that's a good idea. No, I, I love this content. It is Martin, you know, Ontario, all of you, um, please post your suggestions for content. I'm one of the reasons why I'm able to publish so much, so many videos per week and, and put out so much content. I have an entire content plan in Notion. Uh, maybe one day I'll show you guys and girls my, my Notion database. But um, you know, I, I, I have this content plan, so I would love for all of you to contribute. Like, tell me what you want to see. You know, I'm sure it's something that I've worked on in a previous episode um, or, you know, something I'm working on now and I just didn't think about it. And, it, and even if it was something you all wanted to do together, you know, I love the camaraderie, the the collegial sort of atmosphere of our of our community, especially as it continues to grow. So, you know, let me know what videos you all want to see, and I'm happy to make them. But, yeah, I can feel the death stare that Mel is giving me from across the room right now to, to go eat. We're going to go get some um, some lobster. We're in Boston, so we're like, let's get lobster, right? So, anyway, I love all of you. Thank you so much for, for chiming in tonight. You're all probably tired, too. I had a long day of work. But thank you for chiming to these uh, this live stream of Nightlight. Hopefully all of you liked the videos I, I've released since we last talked, before, since the last live stream. Don't forget to subscribe. Please help with the subscriptions. Please help with the watch time. Uh, I, I, I won't be able to hit that 100,000 with all, without all of your help. So um, tell your friends. Anyway, thank you so much. And I, yeah, like I said, I thank you for the compliments about speaking at Harvard. I just can't believe it's such a big bucket list item for me. Um, but yeah, uh, I will see all of you in the next live stream and uh, new videos coming. All of you saw that video that's scheduled to go live. It's happening. The next video, how to recreate the Grand, Bud Grand Budapest Hotel look. I'm so excited about that. It's a cool look. Have any of you seen the printed look from the Grand Budapest Hotel? It is a cool look. I'm like, oh man, maybe I should, you know, grade the printed look for the rest for the new season of Dark Ops. I I really dig this. Um, but there's a new video coming out. It's scheduled on my YouTube channel to premiere on Wednesday uh, of next week. So uh, if any of you are interested in how to create the printed look of the Grand Budapest Hotel, check out that that video. It's going to be amazing. Anyway. Take care of yourselves and each other. We'll see you in the next one.